We start matrices with an introduction and a brief definition. A matrix is a two-dimensional array of numbers, which means they're laid out in a grid pattern like we see here in this rectangular array of numbers. When referring to the dimensions of a matrix, we must specify the number of rows first and the number of columns second. So this order matters. Looking at our matrix, we can see that it has two rows and three columns. One, two on the rows, one, two, three on the columns. So this is what we would call a two by three matrix. The first matrix we're going to look at is the one corresponding to a system of equations. In this example here, we have first our x variable showing up in both equations. Then we see we have the y variable. Then we have our equals. And on the right of the equals, we have numbers. The coefficient matrix is the first one. That is just the coefficients of each variable. So our x has coefficients 2 and 1. This first column corresponds to the variable x. The second column corresponds to the variable y. So we can see that our y variable has coefficients 3 and negative 1. Of course, we do have to maintain the same order that our equations show up in. The augmented coefficient matrix starts with the coefficient matrix on one side. Then it has a dividing line that corresponds to the equal sign in the equations. And on the right of that line, we have the numbers from the right-hand side of the equations. So the augmented coefficient matrix summarizes the entire equation, whereas the coefficient matrix only has a portion of the equations. So to make sense of an augmented coefficient matrix, we would think of the first column co corresponding to generally the variable x, the next column corresponding to y, the line corresponding to the equal sign, and on the right we would have the numbers. To see how this matrix is useful, we have to establish a little bit of background, which is matrix row transformations. These are the three types of things that you are allowed to do to a augmented coefficient matrix when you are trying to solve the system of equations using this matrix method. The first is fairly obvious if we think of each row as being an equation. We can interchange any two rows which of course is allowed because that's just like putting the bottom equation on top and putting the top equation on the bottom. It doesn't actually change either of the equations. So we can see why that works. The second kind of transformation is to multiply any row by a non-zero constant. So I'm not allowed to multiply by zero because that just erases all of my information, but I can multiply any row by a number that is not equal to zero. So row one, in this case, is this first row, two, three, five. I'm going to replace that row with every one of those numbers multiplied by negative two, which gives me negative four, negative six, and negative 10. The third type of transformation is the most complicated, and that is the one that's also the most useful. This is adding a constant multiple of any row to another row, replacing it in the matrix. When I say replacing it, I really mean that either of the two rows that went into this computation can get replaced. We just need to make sure we don't replace the other row if there happens to be another row. So in this case, row 1, or my R1, is what I started with in the first row. R2 refers to what I started with in the second row. I am going to perform this operation, which I'll do down kind of off to the side here and then put the result in. First of all, negative 2 times row 1 is equal to, if we're taking this row right here and multiplying each 
entry by negative 2. That becomes negative 2, positive 2, and 0 times negative 2 remains 0. Row 2 stays exactly as it is. 2, 3, 5. And then when I add them together, I just add them entry by entry. So negative 2 plus 2 is 0. 2 plus 3 is 5. 0 plus 5 is 5. And I put the result here in my matrix. So all of this was just part of one transformation. You may find that at first it's helpful to write your transformations down off to the side like I did here, and eventually when you get very comfortable with them, you may be able to do them in your head and leave this calculation out. So either of those is fine as long as you are indicating what your transformation is, like we see right here. We've written down what the transformation is so that the person who's following the steps can tell what it is you are intending to do uh, in case something goes wrong. And for practice, I recommend trying this one. We are assuming that R1 refers to the top row and R2 refers to the bottom row. So try pausing this video and calculating negative 3 R1 plus R2 and see if you get the same thing I get. For me, multiplying the first row by negative 3 gave me negative 3, positive 6, positive 6, and leaving the second row exactly as it is, 3, negative 7, 5. I would add these together to get 0, negative 1, 11 for that row. So since we've got this one in the form right here, we can start to point out some other things too. So far we've just seen what the allowed transformations are, but we haven't really gotten into the point. Having a zero here is, if we think of this again as representing an equation, that means that we no longer have an x term. So if we think about the process of solving systems of equations by the elimination method, we're adding equations together or we're adding multiples of equations together and trying to eliminate a variable. This method that we use with matrices is really following the same idea, but it's less writing because we're not writing down all of the equations with the variables and it's easier to keep track of because we have all of our equations summarized in this matrix at each step. So it's really simulating that elimination process, but we're doing it with matrices instead of with equations. So here we can start to establish what our goal is. We call this Gaussian elimination with matrices, and the idea is that we want to use row transformations to get our matrix into what we call row echelon form. That form for a two by two matrix is what we see here. We would describe that as ones on the diagonal, where the diagonal starts from the upper left corner and goes down. And below the diagonal we have zeros, And these squiggles here, these little tildes, are intended to represent any number. These are whatever they come out to be when we're really trying to optimize the diagonal and below the diagonal. For our 3x3 three three system of equations, it's the same description, and this is how it looks. We have three ones on the diagonal, we have three zeros below, and then we have six other numbers that can be any value. So looking at a 2x2 two two example first to get this process down, we will then go on to a 3x3 three three example afterwards. So this uh, equation as an augmented coefficient matrix, we're just converting each equation into just its coefficients, looks like this. 
And our first step is to get that one in the upper left corner. So there's a certain order we need to follow here. The easiest way to do that is by swapping rows if I have a one in the first position in any of my rows. So I'm going to choose to just swap these two rows and that gives me one, negative two, negative five on the top row, two, three, four on the bottom row. The next thing I'm going to go after is this zero below the one. The transformation that I can use to get this is negative two times row one plus row two. So let's go ahead and do that transformation off to the side. Negative two times row one is equal to negative two, positive four, positive ten. And row two, we found to be two, three, four. So adding these two rows together gets me zero, seven, fourteen. That's what I'm going to put in the bottom here. Now the only number that isn't what I want it to be is this seven right here. I need ones. <clears throat> along the diagonal, so that's these, and zeros below it, so that seven I'm going to make into a one by multiplying the whole row by this fraction one-seventh. That gets me zero, one, two. So I can now read off the equations. The first equation is one x minus two y equals negative 5. The second equation is 0x plus 1y equals 2. But of course this is a kind of silly looking form for these equations. So what these equations really are are x minus 2y equals negative 5 and y equals 2. We can see that the point of getting the matrix into row echelon form is that we now have this nice triangular form where I can back substitute starting from the bottom and my substitutions will always be easy. So we're going to work our way up. starting by substituting 2 into the equation above it. So that gives me x minus 2 times this value of y, which is 2, is equal to negative 5. And that is, of course, x minus 4 equals negative 5. Adding 4 to both sides gets me that x is equal to negative 1. So I have the ordered pair negative 1 comma 2 as the solution to this system of equations. So we do this with a 2 by 2 system first just because the process is simpler. But of course there are so many ways of solving 2 by 2 systems of equations that are relatively quick and simple that generally people would not ever choose the matrix approach here. Where it really starts to pay off is when we have a 3 by 3 or even a 4 by 4 system of equations, in which case there's much more to keep track of, and then having the structure of a matrix starts to pay off.